chapter of Joshua, I want to talk to you about critical transition. Chapter 3, beginning to read verse 1. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. And after three days, the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. And this is what they said. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards, that's about a kilometre, between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. So Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, pass on ahead of the people, so they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to insult you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. That sounds like a pretty good idea, isn't it? Go and stand in the river. And that's exactly what they did. Now I want to talk to you about critical transition because I believe the Lord spoke to me and Mark uh, rang me up, Pastor Mark rang me up and said would you come down for a couple of Sundays. I really felt the Lord put the word transition in my mind, the change from one stage to another stage. And that's what the Christian experience and what church life is all about, going from one stage to another. Lord taking you on further in the things of God. And in this case, as we look at this story, there's a transition not only of the people from the wilderness into the promised land, but a transition from Moses to Joshua, to a leadership change as well as a change for the people. So there was a sense of a a recommissioning. And that's what I feel the Lord is wanting to do with your church, is to recommission you and to do something very, very different in the process of time. And anything that's different, we have difficulty coming to terms with because we like things as they are. We like things to, to settle in and keep on doing things the same way. But God's got a habit of blowing you out of, the, out of your comfort zone and putting you into a position where you have to totally rely on him and realise, hey, if we're going to find our way here, we're going to have to hear from the Lord and do what the Lord wants. That's why I want to emphasise that verse where it says quite clearly, you have not been this way before. This is new. This is new territory. God is taking you into new territory. So when God called and commissioned Joshua for the great task of taking them into the land, let me just give you a little bit of background here. The invasion and conquest of the promised land wasn't going to be easy. We sort of tend to think, oh, well, they would have been half-naked savages, etc. That would have been easy take. But actually, they were facing a prosperous people. The people of Canaan were not, they were an advanced culture. They were the, the Hittites, the Amorites, powerful tribes belonging to nations as world conquerors. And here was Israel on the edge of their land without armory, and so they stood only with God. And God and you, that's enough to meet any demand. So here they are on the edge of this. And the fear of God was upon the people in the land. The Bible tells us in Joshua 2 and verse 9 that fear, when we heard it, our, at the, we realised that the Lord had brought fear upon the country and they were at a point where they were better armed, better trained, and yet these people that were waiting to come and take their land didn't have any armories at all. They just simply had God, and God put his fear into their hearts, the fear of God. There's something about that. The fear of God was upon the people of the land, and I just pray the Lord will bring the fear of God into Australia and the fear of God into our world. Romans tells us there is no fear of the Lord before their eyes. 
We're not talking about a, a cringing fear. We're talking about a fear that makes you recognise the majesty of his glorious presence. It's a kind of a fear of the, the most powerful force of the world, the fear of God. And we desperately need that in Australia. We desperately need it. We've become godless. Anything that, that even smacks of Christianity, the immediately the media is on the Christians' backs. Well, friends, we've got to change that. We've got to stand up and say, hey, hey, hey. We're not putting up, I don't mean in a fighting sense, but in the true sense, stand up for the truth and let the, the nation know the truth about God. So the fear of God was upon the people of the land, but this new generation was born in the wilderness, a new generation completely. Remember, the old generation had completely died out. And please note, not through lack of provision, not because God wasn't there, not because they had failed to be able to eat or drink and died as a result of that. They died because they failed to believe God. They died because of unbelief. And that's the same situation now. We're going to be very careful not to allow Christianity to lose its power because of our unbelief. Even Jesus, the Bible says about him, he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now we're not talking about uh, uh, just a doubt. We're talking about a militant, arrogant unbelief. A kind of unbelief that says we're not having what you're bringing. And so here the people are on the edge of the land being instructed by God. And this is what God says to them. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions. Now this is a, a direct statement. Early in the morning... As Joshua brought the people together, he wanted them to realise the awesomeness of what was about to take place, where they are going. And I want you to feel now, prophetically, that you're on the edge of some of the greatest days of your ministry. Now, I know Mark and Sue have been here in Franklin, I think it's 20 odd years. They've been laboring in this area. And I want you to understand something. You can tell them when they get back that the next stage is going to be greater than the last. God is going to do something very splendid for his glory. He's going to open doors miraculously that you couldn't dream about. God is going to do something that will just blow your minds away as he works for you. And I'm speaking prophetically now. This is a recommissioning. God is saying, I'm going to pick you up and this time I'm going to take you on eagle's wings in the process of what I'm about to do amongst you. Now in the distance they could see the brown rugged mountains rising about three and a half thousand feet above the plain as they stood where they were. And nearer just six miles or if you like in kilometres, nine and a half kilometres away was the, the fortress of the city of Jericho, the walled city of Jericho. Only nine and a half kilometres from where they were. Now how did they show that they believed God would take them across Jordan into this good land. Let's understand how they began. They began to act in faith and in obedience. Now you, sometimes faith requires that I do things before I've done them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do things before I've done In other words, the, the word of God comes into my heart and I accept that word above all the other things that are happening around me, above all the circumstances that face me, and I'm saying, I know this is going to happen. Now when uh, Joshua is looking at, at Jericho a little later on, God says to him, see, I have given Jericho into your hands. Jericho is still there, the walls are still up, the people are in, still inside the city, but God says, see, I have given. Now what does that mean? Faith has got to take hold of what God is saying above what the circumstances were declaring. They were still there. The walled city was there. The people were still in the city, but God said, see, I have given. And I'll guarantee you, God's done that to you many times where he said, ah, oh, this is what I'm going to do. And you've got to stand your ground and then begin to act in faith and in obedience, declaring what God says above what you can see. 
about the circumstance that surrounds you. And you say, we're going in to take the land for the glory of God. Frankston belongs to Jesus. Amen. And all the areas that surround it, they belong to the Lord Jesus. So they began to act in faith and obedience. And then the next thing they did was they sought God for instructions. What are the instructions? And then they sent officers out to give the people the exact directions concerning their duties and their responsibilities. Now listen carefully, will you? The campaign against Canaan was wise, well-planned military strategy. This was no some spasmodic happenstance that was about to take place. This was God giving them a military strategy. God does not a, a conduct his affairs in a hit and miss way. God always does things well. He do, the Bible says that he does all things well. And so as they boarded the land, God gave them an order. And this was the order. The priests were to lead the way, carrying the Ark of the Covenant upon their shoulders as a symbol of the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant was the symbol of the presence of God in the ranks of Israel. He said, so they're to go first. They're to lead the way. The main body of people are to follow on one kilometre behind the Ark of the Covenant as the priests take the Ark of the Covenant down towards River Jordan. Now it's still the same today. Those who are called to leadership still have to be the ones that have to step out in front and lead the way and move towards the destination that God has planned for you. What would the Ark of the Covenant speak to the people about? It would remind them of the glorious faithfulness of God. I love sitting down just thinking sometimes of the marvellous things God has done through the years. And just everybody needs a little remembrance book where you just look back and think, wow, only God could have brought us through that moment in our lives. In fact, Barbara was reading last night the, uh, the latest book that's come out from Queen, the Queen of England, the, our Queen as well. And she says in there, she said, I would not have been able to, this is her 90th statement, she said, I would not have been able to achieve what I have done without the faithfulness of God. These are her words. The faithfulness of God. She's declaring, hey, all the years that I've been here doing what I've been doing is because of the faithfulness of God. I thought it was great coming from the monarch. Now you may be a Republican, I don't know, but that doesn't, doesn't alter the fact that the woman who has been placed in the position she has been placed in is relying on the faithfulness of God to take her there. And when you think back over what the Lord has done, reminding yourself of the faithfulness of God, the psalmist did it all the time. If you read the psalms, he's always reminding himself of what God has done. He says this, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my commandment, commandment, the covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession for all the earth is mine. This is God speaking and reminding them about his faithfulness. God expected them to obey him and keep his commandments. You remember the old hymn, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Now that still applies. It hasn't changed because we're singing different choruses. The fact is the biblical principle is you trust and you obey. You fulfil what you know God wants you to do and you go ahead and do it obediently to the hand of God. He wouldn't be depending upon them to keep his promises and fulfil his word. Now he had proved by past deliverances the kind of God that he was. And you know, we, we live according to the way in which we've been taken, the process of life that the Lord has led us through. And here we are today in the 20th century, 21st century, 2016. Never ever thought we'd get there. But here we are, and because of the faithfulness of God, the ark of God is before us. He is able. God is the source of our strength. Hallelujah. 
Blessed be. Say it to yourself right now. God is the source of my strength. God is the source of the church's strength. God is the choice, the source of Jubilee Church's strength. If you want to go anywhere, it's got to be God. And that's Mark and Sue. That's their heart as well. They want to know God's desire for the future. But then it says this. The people are to stay behind the Ark of the Covenant one kilometre. Now why, why did God make that instruction? Why did they have to stay so far behind the Ark? Well, I want to tell you why. First of all, the cloud was gone and the pillar of fire was gone that had led them through the wilderness. That was gone. Yes. Now they were to be led by the word of God alone. They were to follow the Ark of the Covenant of God. No other forms of leadership, no pillars of fire, no clouds, nothing. And God wanted every Israelite to be able to view the Ark of the Covenant as it bobbled its way down towards the banks of River Jordan because on the shoulders of the priests as they moved their way down he wanted every eye of the Israelites focused on the Ark. And what does that speak in the New Testament sin? Focus on Jesus. Every eye of the people of God in this Jubilee Church should be focused not on Mark Whitby but on Jesus Christ and Mark Whitby, who becomes Jesus' representative in the leadership of this place. So that we focus our eyes on the one who we know will get us there. That's Jesus. And that's what God was trying to do with the Israelites. Get your eyes off everything else and all the issues that are surrounding you and all the walled cities up ahead of you. I want you focusing on me. Why? Because he said, you've not passed this way before. And if you're going somewhere where you've never been, you need a spiritual GPS. You need God's guiding hand. You've not passed this way before. See, sometimes life becomes a daily routine and, and we may lose all consciousness of the guidance of God and we can so easily allow the unpredictability of life to overtake us because we fail to keep our eyes upon the guiding hand of our gracious God, the GPS of the Holy Spirit. We've been up to China many, many times, I've told you before, but there's one old pastor that impressed me one day. He said, I've been four years away, I haven't seen my wife for four years, because the, ch the police chased him out of the village. And he said, I've been on the run for four years. But he said, the police have never caught up to me. I said, why is that? Well, he said, because I've got an intelligence system that they haven't got. <laughs> I thought, wow, coming from an old Chinese pastor, I've got an intelligence system that they have not got. In other words, he says, the Spirit of the Lord says, move on. He said, so I know, I move on. He said, as soon as the Spirit speaks to me, I'm off. He said, because he knows that he'll always be ahead of them because he's got a system that's guiding him. And spiritually speaking, I want you all, when you're in prayer, to be sensitive spiritually to the GPS of the Spirit. And say, where do you want us to go, Lord? You know how when you sit in your car and the GPS is there, it's running and it's got the colour on the, the road that it wants you to take. And when you're coming towards the change, you hear, in 750 metres, take the left-hand turn and go down Golf Links Road and you'll come to Robinson Road, etc., etc., down there. It gives you warning of the turn. God's personal service. Let's, yeah, personal service. Let me just step in here to say, with the will of God, remember it's the will of God. Got that? Not my will, but His be done. And if it's the will of God, I must be sensitive to what He says. So don't think to yourself, oh, I think I've got a better route. I can get there by a different road. I'll take this next road down here on the left and I'll find, that, find my way there. Anyway. Listen, you get away from what God says. And you're going to be in all sorts of deep trouble. You've got to be walking and listening to the voice of the Spirit of God and taking going where He tells you to go. We need guidance daily. It's a shaky one, particularly when we're in a critical transition. We need guidance much more directly than we do normally because this is God saying, I'm taking you in a new direction. 
so that the distance that God wanted between them was so that every eye could be riveted on the Ark of the Covenant as it's made its way down towards River Jordan. And then there was further instructions. God says through Joshua to the priests, he says, when you get to the water, I want you to walk straight into the water. Straight into the water. Now the people obeyed with courage and faith and began this orderly and systematic preparation so that they would do what God said. I just, I just want to stop there to contrast the fear of the previous generation. I don't know whether you're aware of it, but when Joshua led the people of Israel into the Promised Land, he was 85 years old. How'd you like to be an 85-year-old leader of a couple of million people, two and a half million people probably, because 600,000 fighting men and their families left Egypt. Now if you multiply that by four, that's two and a half million people he's got in his charge. That's a pretty good bunch of people, isn't it? And he led them according to the directions of the Lord, the clear directions of the Lord. But that previous generation were utterly fearful. And that's why we said earlier on they died out because they failed to believe God. But this new generation of people were filled with faith. They were ready to go. They were ready to do what God wanted them to do. The air of expectancy and faith was in their hearts. But were they really ready? Now the Bible says this. Joshua told the people, verse 5, Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. Now, what does consecrate yourself mean? What it means is set yourselves apart. Because that's what sanctify means. Set yourself apart. Get ready for what God wants to do. Get connected with God in such a way that you're ready to do exactly what He wants you to do when He says it. And you're ready to obey. Now remember, it's so important that special manifestations of God call for special preparation. It doesn't just happen. There's no such thing as a happenstance. It has to be pre preparation. God never does anything haphazardly. Always prepares his people and prepares, prepares his vessels, ready for what he wants to do and what he wants to achieve. He gets us ready. And when he's getting you ready, he'll frighten you to death. <laughs> he will, with, with the fake challenges that are before. When he starts putting you there, oh, yeah. you feel like shrieking away, but be ready. Be prepared. Be the kind of person that's set aside in God's purposes and say, I'm going. I'm going through. I'm going to win to the glory of God. I'm going to proceed. So, specially prepare your hearts. And allow God to give special manifestations of his presence amongst you. I'm talking about the manifest presence of God saying, this is where we're going. God demands this heart-searching prayer, heart-searching praise, genuine consecration that says, we're going with you, Lord. God, listen, God's more willing to bless us than we are to receive it. He's more anxious to pour out his spirit on us then we are to receive His Spirit. And so He's anxiously waiting for us to get into the position where we say, Come on, Lord, pour it out. Now, you were jumping in the river today. Luke got a bit tired up there, though. <laughs> jumping in the river. I, I don't know how, how, how he knew which way. Because when he goes to the right, we would go the other way, wouldn't we? When he goes to the left, we would go the other way. So I'm thinking to myself, which way's right? Which way is right? Right. That's right. Absolutely right. <laughs> so here God is getting his people ready. And please understand that character always comes before power. So important we realise that God's more concerned about you and the way you are than what he does through you. He likes to get his vessel ready. Ready to be powerfully used for his glory. I often think about Evan Roberts, that young warrior in Wales. He couldn't preach to save his life. He wasn't a preacher. 
He used to get up behind the pulpit and just pray and pray. And the crowds would come rolling in and people were getting saved and he wasn't preaching, he was praying. <laughs> and in the space of a few, of nine months, 100,000 people came to Christ. They emptied jails, they emptied hotels in the Welsh Revival, all because of a young guy that prayed. And listen, when he finished his ministry, it was only a matter of months. They never heard much about him at all again. That was it. He was gone, off the scene. But God picked him up, used him to produce the Welsh Revival, and then the Welsh Revival spread around the world. Welsh evangelists and revivalists went all over the world sharing what the, what the Lord had done there in Wales. And he lasted 10 months. But the result of that went round the world because vessels were prepared for his service. And God wants to do that in this place. What I felt very distinctly, the Lord saying to me, these people have got to get themselves ready. And just imagine if you were one of the priests and you've got the Ark of the Covenant on your shoulders and you're bubbling down towards the river. And remember the Bible says it was the river was in flood tide. It wasn't just the river. It was a flood tide river. And so they made their way down. Just think leadership has got to go out there and walk right into the river. That's a bit of a challenge. A faint challenge, but as they made their way down, I often think there was, I'd like to try and put myself in the place where one of those priests were as they made their way down with that on their shoulders. What would have happened if they'd stopped at the edge of the river and watched to see if anything might happen? Nothing would have happened. Nothing at all would have happened because they had to be absolutely and totally obedient to the word of God, which is to walk right into the river. Now that means faith has got to break past the natural fears, the natural confusions, and step right into the water. And as they did, the Bible says, the water began to part. They were trailblazers. They were much depended on them. The water receded. Hallelujah. Do you have a Jordan in front of you? Do you have something in front of you? You do as a church that looks, oh, it's pretty bleak. We haven't got a place to be. I want to tell you, God will give you one. He'll open a door that no man can shut. He'll close a door that no man can open. He'll do something very specifically for you. But then there was something further. And this is uh, another test. God says, I want the priests to actually stay in the riverbed until all the people had passed over. Now think about this. Two and a half million people. That'll take a while. That's, that's half the city of Melbourne. Just think about the egress of half the city of Melbourne passing you by as you stand there with the ark on your shoulders. I mean, just standing with the ark on your shoulders is, is enough. But then they have to stand there while two and a half million people passed you by. I think it was me. Two million four hundred and twenty-nine, <laughs> two million four hundred and thirty. You'd be counting them off, wouldn't you? As they went by. Do you know what God wanted them to do? He wanted to get that why he wanted the ark there was as the Israelites passed through into the promised land, they're passing through because of God. The Ark of the Covenant. The, the, and when you start moving and miracles start happening in relation to you down here, you'll be looking and saying, ah, this is God. This is the prophetic word of the Lord in our hearts. He wanted them to realize it was his doing. He wanted them aware of his presence as they passed the priests by. They were trailblazers, certainly, leading the way. And also, like true shepherds, captains, making sure that everybody gets through. That's the, that's the joy of the shepherd, to make sure every one of the sheep make it across. And you know what it makes me think of? The cross of Jesus Christ. Someone mentioned that tonight, didn't they? The cross of Jesus Christ thrust into the stream of human history. And God says, 
This is the changing point for human history. This is where it all changes, at the cross, at the cross where we first saw the light. It's there in that stream of human history, the cross of Jesus Christ, standing, raising its wonderful face to the world and saying, Jesus is our captain. He's blazed the trail through and he's standing there until we all get through. Until we all get through. Jesus Christ, our mighty King. And the psalmist says, He's beset me behind and before. And there are others just gone in front of me. He's with me. And He's behind me as well, making sure that I get there. And then He says this. He said, when you get over the other side, I want you to get some memorial stones and erect them in the river. Before you... Before I bring the river back into shape again, I want some stones to be placed there in the river. He says, these stones, that's chapter 4, in fact, if you look at verse 3, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, right from where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So they would take stones with them out of the river, and then in verse further down when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan, Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So on their way, the priests not only had to carry the ark, but they had to pick up some stones. Well, not necessarily the priests, but some had to pick up 12 stones, bring them out on the riverbank and erect them there as memorial stones to the fact that God brought them through. Now I'm just saying to you today, get some memorial stones because you're about to journey on a journey of faith. And God wants some memorial stones kept so that you can look back and say, hey, that's what the Lord did for us. This is the way the Lord has led. And you've got to look back and think, wow, wow. This is the way the Lord. We've never been this way before. We're moving in new territory and we want to recognise the magnificence of the ability of God, of God to take us where he wants us to go. Are you with me now? Yes. Because God is wanting to inspire you to realise what's ahead of you is going to be miraculous. And I'm sure that God is even putting into Pastor Mark and Sue's minds right now strategies that he'll bring into place in this community. You're going to see some amazing things. Amazing things that God is going to do. Amazing processes of God's purposes in your lives. And I want you to be encouraged today because the thing that God wants to say to you today is consecrate yourselves. In other words, set yourselves apart. Get ready for what God wants you to start thinking during the week. Hey, I'm getting ready. What do you do when you move? You clean up. You pack up. And you get ready to go. So spiritually, clean up. Pack up. Get rid of your baggage. And get ready to go. Because that God wants to take you in a new territory for the glory of his wonderful name. Bless his name. Let's pray. Father, we're so absolutely delighted to know that we're being led by you. Hallelujah. Oh, you said they that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God.